Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Sprague from Persimmon Health. I am a serial entrepreneur working on healthcare technology that helps more people access better quality of care. This podcast is for the movement of innovators, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders that are advancing the American healthcare system through digital health. In this podcast, we highlight real stories of innovators and enablers of digital health, their opportunities, challenges, and learnings for innovation. We'll cover topics such as startup building and fundraising, entrepreneurship, emerging technologies, and big ideas to transform healthcare. We invite you to participate in this community, share your stories, and accelerate the movement. Thank you. We have an awesome pod. Enjoy. Hello, digital health community. Today, I'm excited to have on Ken Mayer, founder and CEO of Safe Health Systems. That's at safehealth.me. Safe is operated in partnership with Mayo Clinic and offers a turnkey digital health platform that offers provider services, diagnostics, and interops with many EHRs out of the box. And this allows customers to deploy really targeted apps and population health programs within weeks instead of months or years. Ken, I think it's exciting that your platform comes with all of these parts included, and I'm eager to learn more about what it can do. Welcome to the pod. Would you mind telling us briefly about yourself? Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for for having us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, So actually, my background was really in uh, entertainment and marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, I started uh, while I was in college. I built a little entertainment magazine, kind of a small uh, LA Weekly or Village Voice, uh, and ended up selling that to Gannett when I was 19. And I was going to school in in North Carolina, and I moved up uh, to New York City and launched a production company and about a year later ended up getting uh, a TV show on Fox. Uh, It was about the worst time slot on television, Friday nights at 1230. There was about three people watching, but I got to spend my twenties strumpsing around the world, filming bands and, um, you know, having a good time living in New York city. Um, In uh, late, I guess, 99, I uh, transitioned into tech and launched a predecessor to YouTube uh, called GTV. Um, and it was, okay. you know, basically a platform that allowed people to upload uh, videos and photos. Uh, you had what we called at the time mm-hmm. a buddy list because we were kind of drawing concepts uh-huh. from instant messaging um, and, uh, and a wall, essentially, that we called message boards where you could communicate with the right. people watching your content. But we launched it in the spring of 99 and it became so popular so quickly, uh, we mm-hmm. had to take it about nine months later after burning through $10 million in bandwidth. Wow. Costs, okay. Which uh, hadn't been oh. commoditized yet. And the infrastructure really yep. you know, wasn't there. I mean, to put it in context, YouTube launched six years later and right. burned through about 60 million in bandwidth costs uh, before being acquired uh, for, for over a billion dollars. So not a bad return right. on investment, but I was like, you know, in my mid twenties and, had no idea how to raise uh, 60 million. So oh, man. Uh, we ended yeah, up ahead, ahead of the time. Yeah, it was. And we ended up pivoting and, and, and selling uh, the company uh, about four years later, we acquired a small company okay. in South America that had a really sophisticated enterprise instant messaging platform. Um, uh-huh. And at the time you had a lot of businesses bringing IM to work. It was pre texting on, on cell phones and, uh, you know, it uh, it was a big problem for the CIOs and uh, mm-hmm, Serbian mm-hmm. and actually HIPAA had had just come out, which required right. uh, encrypting personal health information that was sent out over the web. And at the time, mm-hmm. you know, people were just attaching PDFs to emails, um, which uh, you know was was basically in violation of these new HIPAA regulations that that mm-hmm, not many mm-hmm. people understood. Um, so, so we had some big clients, a lot of uh, uh, you know payers that had okay. sort of field offices that were sending claims forms uh, just right. over email. So uh, we ended up selling out, I ended up selling out of that in 2006 and moved out to LA um, and was uh, playing around in the movie business and, and had the opportunity really to get into what uh, became Safe Health Systems um, about uh, four years ago. Um, so that's- Got it. Awesome. And what, what did inspire you to start Safe Health? So originally, you know, the concept uh, was an app that let people show their verified STD status privately on their phone. Okay. And provided a, 
an easy and expensive way to get get tested and treated. Um, you know, right. at the time when when you know sort of conceptualized the app, um, STD rates had just hit an all time high in the U.S. Now uh-huh, for five uh-huh. consecutive years in a row, um, and uh, you know it was basically an answer to the fact that the dating apps have really made casual yep. sex much more accessible and accepted. And, you know, one of the unintended consequences of that is just these increased right. STD rates. So this seemed like a real logical, simple solution to it. Um, we launched it um, about five years ago. Um, we've rebranded okay. it since to, to safely. Um, and uh, at the time I thought it was going to be this really simple, quick thing. We'd build right. it and sell it off to one of the dating apps and, uh, little did mm-hmm. I know how disjointed, you know, the the uh, electronic health record systems in the U.S. were, right? How sort of bifurcated yep. and non-interoperable. Um, and this right. was at the very early stages of the ONC pushing uh, for interoperability standards, which ultimately fire mm-hmm. FHR uh, is yep. what, you know, most of the big EHRs. And I think now there's pretty much unanimous sort of uh, agreement that, that that should be the file uh, data model standard. Right. Uh, so, but that was really the key feature, right? We needed to figure out how to let mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. import the recent STD test results for free from anywhere. And that was sort of the initial challenge that we, we had to face. And, um, you know, what we realized is there was no silver bullet. And, and we now have mm-hmm. that as a real core component, an enabling foundational level system uh, within our broader platform now is, is, Mm-hmm. integrations with all of the right. EHRs and, and, and we're part of and integrated with uh, the largest national HIEs, the health information exchanges mm-hmm. uh, so that we can pull patient records in uh, and then also push data back out uh, to enable right. continuity of care. But that really was, um, you know, that, that feature that, that now really developed hardened system, uh, the original right. impetus for it was really just to let people, you know, access a sort of uh, tamper-proof digital workflow for proving their STD testing uh, uh, status. Got it. And then how did you evolve from there into more connected care, at-home diagnostics and and telehealth and become a platform for for others to use? Yeah. So, you know, basically the first challenge was how do we let people import their recent test results to show it. That was the hook, right? That was the free right. use case and something really simple. And you have, you know, millions of, of people out there that are, you know, carrying around mm-hmm. on the, a mm-hmm. screenshot on their phone of their test results. But if you go to Google and you want to see something super alarming, search for fake STD test, right? And there's dozens of sites that allow you to make just that, right? And, yeah. and not that people are trying to cover up chronic infections, but it's like they get caught off guard. They're going on a hookup. It's five o'clock, six o'clock at night. Yeah. That was really step one. Then we said, okay, now we need to provide an easy and expensive way to get tested, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and we want to have insurance covered okay. because all insurance, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the commercial payers cover STD testing. And it's fairly expensive for a six panel test. You know, the CMS uh-huh. rates are around $350 uh, total uh-huh. for like a seven, seven test panel. Um, and you have, you know, options for at home, like Everly Well and stuff like that. But even those are $200, $250, right? And it's all out of pocket, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. health. And none of those, you know, at home testing solutions are currently reimbursable. Um, mm-hmm. So what we realized then is we need to requisition these tests as medically necessary by a licensed mm-hmm. clinician uh, in order to okay. have them covered, right? And then we also needed to have integrations with the reference labs like Quest and LabCorp in order mm-hmm, to have, mm-hmm. you know, thousands of locations that people can book the testing, you know, in their local area, right? So the first step is we went and we, we forged partnerships with, with Quest and LabCorp. We did uh, these very intensive sort of uh, HL7 interfaces uh, with their backend mm-hmm. systems for orders and results and scheduling, um, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. took, you know, over a year uh, to not only uh, do the HL7 integrations, but then get them certified through a very intensive process. Um, okay. So now we have integrations and we've got 6,000 locations that people can schedule testing. Now we needed the providers to requisition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So right. We then set out and built a national healthcare practice uh, and brought in, you know, physicians that were licensed across all 50 states um, 
that could be used to requisition the tests and then triage the positive test cases, right? Because right. if you order the test, you now have a responsibility if it comes back positive for chlamydia to make sure that that person gets a follow up mm -hmm. in a timely way and, and then ultimately a treatment plan, generally a, a prescription, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, so we built out that part and, you know, that was, you know, challenging in itself to set up a, a national, you know, professional medical corporation and uh, yep. So we overcame all of that. And then we said, look, it's, it's actually, you know, not efficient to do traditional telehealth, um, synchronous, mm -hmm. with synchronous telehealth, uh, just to requisition tests. So we then built a system um, for basically creating what we call virtual consults. So questionnaires that mimic right. the dialogue you'd have with your doctor at the point mm -hmm. of care. Right. And then the, the, mm -hmm. the answers to those questions are, are reviewed by a clinician that's licensed in the state where the user is. Um, right. And their MPI, their license is used to requisition the test as medically necessary. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, and then ultimately, um, it, when the results come back in, they're reviewed by, again, a, a clinician that's licensed in the state where the user is. And if they're positive, they follow up and triage with a, with a prescription. But so then in order to pull all that off, we had to build what we now call the assisted care automation engine which basically okay. lets us notify the protocols for in-person doctor mm -hmm. visit, right? Into these mm -hmm. virtual consults. Um, and we also then needed to tie in with sure scripts to handle the e-prescribing uh, right. part. Of it. And then we needed, you know, again, the EHR integrations, we utilize that to push the records back into the patient's mm -hmm. main uh, health record uh, to ensure continuity of care. Um, so, so a lot of these features and functionality that we've now are on version two or version three in terms of iterations of improving and making uh -huh, it more scalable uh -huh. for us, uh, really started just out of necessity with this one little sort of what right. we thought was going to be this very, very yeah, simple. Yeah, solving your own problem. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So what we did in, uh, in we, we, we met Mayo Clinic, um, the, the, the Mayo Ventures team, um, I guess mid 2019 um, okay. and explain to them that, Hey, this is what we've built so far. We want to take a step back um, mm -hmm. and actually create a platform that makes it quick and easy to create these type of population health apps. Right. Yep. And you look at NERCs, Roman, Hims, Livongo, kind of the first mm -hmm. round of what are being called pop health apps. And, mm -hmm. you know, they cost, you know, millions of dollars and several years to get to market. Um, if you yep. look at overall software development success rate trends, probably 80% that tried to make it to market failed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we said, okay, what's really needed in the market to take advantage of this new sort of semi-automated virtual mm -hmm. first care model um, models is, is basically a Shopify for, 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 right. for digital health apps. And, and that's really what mm -hmm. we built out is we leveraged all those core systems and integrations mm -hmm. into the existing, you know, national mm -hmm. healthcare infrastructure, um, and, and and basically abstracted it into a low to no code solution that makes it really fast and easy to stand up, really specialized, um, yep. you know, digital health apps that, that that can be, you know, very easily configured or white labeled to service the specific needs of different populations or use cases. Um, so that's, that's how it kind of evolved to where we're, where we're at now. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and it's kind of full stack and all parts included and, and all people included that you would need to do things like the consults and the requisitions. Uh, who do you think your platform is, or what use cases do you think your platform is more purpose built for today or to enable today? Well, I mean, you know, anybody who's looking to remove friction from mm -hmm. uh, a clinical workflow or reduce mm -hmm. cost uh, and, and right. really increase accessibility. So, you know, a right. real hot topic lately has been, you know, health mm -hmm. equity and people who don't have transportation and how do you move those right. clinical services into the home? Um, another big one is, is you look at the telehealth industry and, you know, population health apps that have been mm -hmm. coming out and they really hold the promise to substantially reduce cost and, and increase accessibility. Um, yep. they're missing one critical element, right? Even the 800 pound gorillas in the telehealth space, like Teladoc and Doctor on Demand, don't have any at-home testing capabilities integrated right. into them. So, 
part of our platform, you know, on one side is the sort of Shopify of digital health apps where very quickly stand up these kind of turnkey custom solutions. The other yep. side of it is an SDK, an orders and results interface um, okay. that enables um, telehealth providers uh, to mm -hmm. basically add connected home testing capabilities uh, to their to their service offering, right? And it, it fills a big gap mm -hmm. in, in their service offering today, but it also uh, really expands the scope of care scenarios that they can service where they're very limited now, right? Care scenarios right. that either don't require testing or that they can kind of get away with skipping the testing, right? Which is right. really fundamentally causing some problems in a lot of ways sort of violates antibiotic stewardship because what's happening, if you were to mm -hmm, call mm -hmm. telephone right now and say, you know, I think I have strep throat uh, or, you know, UTI uh, is, is they will just prescribe the antibiotics uh, without doing the testing mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. part of the commonly accepted clinical protocol at the point of care, right? So antibiotic right. stewardship and Hippocratic Oath aside, they're also alienated from this very large revenue stream that their point of care counterparts enjoy, you know, point of care testing, $83 billion in the U.S. last year. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, interest uh, from that group, and we're mm -hmm. very close to completing that uh, completing that uh, that SDK. And we're working right. now uh, integrating the first uh, couple partners, um, which, uh, you know, will be enabled with uh, with these, you know, the CDX um, connected home testing capability. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so, I mean, that that would be a, a huge, unique selling proposition for your platform, right? Is just you greatly expand uh, the number of scenarios that you can treat and businesses that you can build around uh, those at-home diagnostics. Um, I, I, I'm curious on the reimbursement side, um, how, how that is handled for different flavors of at-home diagnostics. Like, are, are they all covered as long as you go through certain protocols or are there uh, gray areas? And, and how, how does your platform help uh, adopters navigate that? So there, there, there is some gray area there now. And, and you mm -hmm. know, one of them, just taking COVID testing as an example, right. um, you look at the Lucera COVID flu test, right? Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a rapid molecular test. It's got $142 CMS reimbursement rate um, at the point of care. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you walk mm -hmm. into your doctor and they have a Lucera test that they bought for 50 bucks um, and, and actually swab your nose and run it there at the point of care, they can get reimbursement, from commercial payers or Medicare, or Medicaid. No problem. Right. Then if you look right. at same day health or one of these home nursing testing services, right, the nurse comes to your door, swabs your nose, sits in her car and runs it, puts it into their you know, EHR through through her phone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's okay to file, right? That's a point of care test, and you just put the modifier right. place of service at home. So, mm -hmm, what we're mm -hmm. now engaged with CMS and, and HHS uh, discussing is: Can you utilize telehealth as the equivalent of that place of service at home? Why do you need that sort of nurse coming to the door right. and swabbing your nose and sitting in her car? Uh, isn't it the same or even better uh, to do it through a clinician connected, directed process? Uh, through a CDX enabled app. And, you know, the, the inclination right. there is that it's, uh, the answer is yes, um, okay. it is. So, um, you know, we're, we're working through that now and we're working with McDermott, who's the largest, uh, you know, healthcare uh, attorney mm -hmm. out there. They have a consulting group called McDermott Plus that is um, like a, you know, basically lobbyists uh, as part of what right. they do. Uh, they were the ones that lobbied Congress to get the reimbursement mandate for the eight COVID tests a month. Okay. Um, and later, Congress didn't feel they had um, purview to um, require CMS to reimburse uh, that. But then McDermott Plus then went um, through the at-home testing coalition that they organized uh, to CMS and got CMS to approve that as well. Right. Got it. And then, I, I mean, one question about, um, you know, everyone being able to kind of administer their own tests at home and send it off. 
is just the like the usability and the instructions. And I, I noticed on your guys's website, it looks like you've put a lot of intention uh, behind really explaining how to do different at home tests. Can can you talk around that and, and like you know what are some of the challenges maybe that people face and, and how as an application or platform experience you guys are dealing with that? Yeah, so there's there's a, a couple answers to that. So I mean, first mm -hmm. taking a step back, there's there's really two different types of uh, tests or three different types of tests that are supported okay. by the platform. Um, the first is a return to lab test kit, right? That's you collect at home, uh, you put it in the box, we're integrated with FedEx, mm -hmm. you either drop it at a FedEx or FedEx will come and pick okay. it up. It gets sent to a reference lab and then resulted back into these sort of semi-automated clinical workflows, um, right. you know, in, in, in an app powered by our platform. Right. So that's the mm -hmm. Everly Well, let's get check model. People are pretty familiar with that. Uh, we're enhancing that by connecting it into clinical workflows um, mm -hmm. to enable reimbursement. Um, mm -hmm. The first place that, that we're really pushing that out will be in California, the second half okay. of this year around uh, STD testing. Um, OK, California passed a law in 2021. Uh, requiring commercial payers and CMS or, or Medicaid uh, to reimburse um, at-home STD test kits, return to lab test kits. Um, okay. And that law went into effect uh, last year, and we're now working with payers uh, in California mm -hmm. to enable them with solutions to actually abide by, you know, that that law to implement those workflows. So kind of back to one of your questions earlier, you know, who are some of the customers or some of the use cases um, we really mm -hmm. see payers as being uh, a right. really big beneficiary of this platform because it reduces costs and increases right. accessibility uh, to routine care and chronic disease management uh, workflows mm -hmm. uh, for their members. And, and, and they stand to save not, you know, millions of dollars, but, but billions right. of dollars, um, you know, by, by semi-automating some of these workflows and moving some of these tests into the home. And for instance, you know, they're reimbursing now for an average seven, you know, test uh, STD panel uh, around 350 mm -hmm. to $400 uh, in the mm -hmm. current way mm -hmm. that happens goes into a clinic or goes into their primary care physician, whereas that could be done for under right. 200 uh, using, yeah. using this model. So that's, that's the return to lab bucket. Um, the okay. second is, is rapid uh, lateral flow tests, right? And okay. two years ago, three years ago, I would have used the example of a, of a pregnancy test, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now you can use COVID, COVID antigen sure. tests um, as, as, as the, uh, you know, as the example. So currently you just look at the results, right? And mm -hmm, you could maybe mm -hmm. tell your doctor or whatever, but they can't use that. Those aren't clinically reliable res results if they're conveyed by you, right? Um, okay. You also can't use it for international travel, or other things like that because uh, right. you know, they're just being conveyed. Um, so we have a technology that we call the universal RDT reader. Um, mm -hmm. We had uh, it is a regulated uh, software as a medical device. Um, okay. We submitted it to the FDA um, last year as an EUA, and at the end of the year, they mm -hmm. asked us to submit it as a 510K, which is a permanent okay. uh, filing. Um, the debate there with with the FDA. Um, mm -hmm. for, for went back and forth for almost a year was um, the predicate devices, Healthy IO and ScanWell, which are associated with a UTI test. Um, mm -hmm. They were filed as a UTI test, which, by the way, have a digital read, right? Whereas okay. what we proposed to the FDA that was in the best interest of the public good was for them to approve a universal, our universal RDT reader. They can read any okay. rapid diagnostic uh, lateral flow mm -hmm. test. And it's basically a computer vision AI. So right. you, you hold your phone over. When it gets the right tilt and distance, it automatically takes uh, an image of the cassette. Uh, and then it sends it to this cloud service where a computer vision uh, AI machine learning model uh, interprets it and returns clinically reliable results, uh, you know, again, into that uh, automated, you know, clinical workflow. Um, so what we proposed and what we, you know, really were, mm -hmm. were sort of trying to get the FDA to wrap their heads around was the idea of approving it as software as a medical device platform, right? right. It could read any test. So rather than tightly coupling our clinical study data 
uh, to a particular test, we define mm -hmm. the clinical mm -hmm. study protocol for validating the efficacy of the digital read for a particular test. Right. Um, that way we can onboard lots of different tests quickly. Got it. They don't have to all be separate 510K filings. It could be a supplement against an existing 510K adding the digital read um, that references, you know, all the sort of meat and potatoes or detailed stuff on the on the AI uh, interpretation that's embodied in our in our 510K. So um, yeah. we were invited into an accelerated review uh, process. Okay. Um, and we expect that to be approved. Currently, we have it running in self-assessment mode. So what it does, okay. it's the same process I just described, except the yep. addition of a button where the end user does their personal interpretation, mm -hmm. and then all of right. that information is given to the provider when they review, uh, asynchronously review, or you know, with a synchronous uh, telehealth consult, they have the AI interpretation, the end mm -hmm. user, the patient's interpretation, and then a photo you know, of it so that they're informed and can make clinical decisions based on those. Got it. Got it. And, and then the idea is once FDA approves that the machine learning algorithm will be able to classify the result properly without any of that kind of self-identification of, of the result. And then that will be clinically accepted and reimbursable. Uh, exactly. Well. And, and that's, uh, okay. you know, the way we designed it is, um, you know, we, have a sort of uh, AI training uh, mm -hmm. SOP that's part of you know this this process. Uh, so we capture right. about about a thousand photos. The AI then makes millions of copies with slight permutations, which is mm -hmm, used mm -hmm. as a training set. Um, and you know, so there's ultimately a, a validation process for each test. And then we're now working with test developers to onboard their tests and mm -hmm. validate them on the platform. So there'll be a growing compendium of, you know, CDX uh, enabled tests uh, that, are, right. that are available um, either, you know, through our platform with the custom apps uh, or uh -huh. available through this SDK so that telehealth providers and even through EHR interfaces we're working on now, point of care providers uh -huh. can all sort of order these CDX tests and have them resulted back to that encounter record in the ordering providers instance of their EHR. Right, that's exciting. Um, yeah, how about other types of technology? So, so AI, machine learning, clear use case for your platform. How do you support the, like, let's say remote physiological monitoring or patient monitoring or, or telemedicine um, for improving patient outcomes? So we implemented a third party SDK that's kind of like a Zapier of uh, Bluetooth interfaces for, for mobile mm -hmm. uh, health devices. Okay. Um, and uh, so basically we, we currently support about 600 different devices, um, but we're now going okay. out and actually uh, partnering with select uh, device manufacturers, both on the IVD uh -huh. side where again, we sort of enable their rapid um, in vitro diagnostic tests, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, UTI, HIV, yeah. STD, PSA, uh, drugs of abuse. There's a whole number of those on the IVD side. Um, but now we're also working with actual medical device manufacturers to add things like EKG, blood ops, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thermometer scales to support RPM uh, models and, and, and also to sort of uh, enhance those virtual consults, right? So, you right. can have something that says input your temperature, your weight. So we have that as part of the virtual consults now. And you, you know, slide a slider with your finger, you enter the information. Um, but now you can actually say, okay, I'm using this scale and the scale mm -hmm. or the blood ox or, you know, blood pressure cuff uh, will just uh, sit wirelessly transmit uh, that biometric data. Uh, we're also integrated with, uh, you know, with the Apple Watch um, and, and mm -hmm. the Android. Mm -hmm. Uh, based watches so that you can send biometric data um, from, you know, those wearables mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, into these clinical clinical workflows. That's that's great because it makes the consult more convenient for everyone, more accurate for everyone. And then I think eventually those observations of the RPM will be reimbursable as well. And those are now. I mean, the whole point of remote yeah, patient right. monitoring is it's, it's remote. Right. So those are all very solidified. And, and there are some tests, yep. like I said, with California, they just passed a law with the STD return to lab. Um, mm -hmm, we have mm -hmm. been uh, 
getting reimbursements. Several of our, our customers that are, have kind of white labeled solutions um, mm -hmm. have been getting reimbursed at the $34 uh, rate for the rapid mm -hmm. uh, molecular tests, right? Okay. Um, and what we tend to call it is, I mean, COVID confused things a little bit with this OTC designation. Um, so, you know, the over the counter, I mean, we see these tests being sold over the counter, but you can only use them in conjunction with a clinician connected directed process uh, through a CDX enabled app. Again, one that's mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. on our platform uh, using kind of the shop five digital health app, uh, functionality or, you know, through Teladoc or Doctor on Demand, or, uh, sure. maybe Cedar Sinai's app that's powered by Amwell, mm -hmm. you know, their, their telehealth app. Um, so, you know, the idea is that if you want to utilize the results of the test uh, to, to get a treatment plan, presumably a prescription, right, and you want mm -hmm. it to be mm -hmm. reversed, you'll have to use it and scan it and use it as part of one of these, these workflows. Um, What's right. exciting is we were awarded a, a multi-year contract uh, from HHS uh, last year. Okay. Uh, basically help them and the federal government uh, define standards and set up infrastructure uh, to enable a connected home testing system as part of the national healthcare infrastructure. And part of that is open sourcing the components of our platform and setting up a reference instance uh, for HHS, um, you know, that will basically enable any application right. development uh, to add CDX capabilities, uh, you know, to, to their applications. And it's, it's all based on web 3.0 technologies and microservices, mm -hmm. open API, um, so that, you know, you can really enable not only applications to register themselves, um, and enable okay. communication between end users, say a, a patient and a provider, uh, but also machine to machine communication, which is where things really right. interesting and what the ecosystem you know, the current mm -hmm. healthcare ecosystem is, is lacking, is that sort of coordination layer um, that acts as kind of connective tissue. Right. That's great. So you guys have a uh, platform now and you're open sourcing some of these components and really helping guide HHS, right, and allowing other people to kind of um, build up their, their own solutions and platforms. Uh, but of course, you guys will always be kind of the, like the, the AWS managed version of all of these things, too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. I mean, that, that's really the point. I mean, we can come in and accelerate it, but I mean, we don't want to just keep this to ourselves. I mean, it's important right. that, you know, in order to facilitate all the advantages of, uh, you know, connected home care, right? Yeah. Uh, not only in the cost savings, but again, the accessibility and health equity and uh, absolutely. You know, the reduction in costs is also going to allow for the money that is allocated to a particular yep. condition, right? Like, you know, even take like, you know, prostate cancer or cervical cancer, right? And soon mm -hmm. we'll live in a world where it'll be the norm to do a genetic screening, right? And you'll know, yep. and, and probably not so distant future where you feel res irresponsible as a parent not to have a genetic screening for your newborn baby when they get mm -hmm, their vaccinations, mm -hmm. right? Like, why wouldn't yeah. you want to know their, their, you know, their risks, yeah. Biological data, right. And the risks that mm -hmm. they have. And if you know that they've got a gene mutation that could be mm -hmm. cause a predisposition to a certain type of cancer, and you know that catching that cancer early is going to make it much more treatable, right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to want to monitor it frequently, right. But yeah. the cost of those tests right now and having to go to the point of care to do them, uh, really doesn't mm -hmm. allow for that. But if you could do 50 tests for the price of what it costs a payer to do just one now, then the payer's going to yep. be like, fine, you know, go ahead and do 30. That's still a cost savings for us. And it's better for us because we'll be able to catch, uh, you know, the onset of these um, disease states earlier, which makes them not only more treatable, which is obviously good mm -hmm. for the patient, but also less expensive to treat, which is good for the payer. So yeah, no, I think you're right. I, mm -hmm. Shift in the thinking of how we approach, uh, you know, disease monitoring and, and, and certainly cut a lot of fat off of these just ultra common routine care and chronic disease management uh, scenarios that are just handled in a way that's inefficient today.
Yeah, no, that that's that's really powerful. I think the cost of the system, that's a huge impact. And then also on the consumer side, I don't know how many times myself included, I've been stopped from getting a, 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 you know, a consultation or a diagnostic because I just don't want to take that time to go in uh, to a point of care or have a, a less uh, comfortable conversation with someone I don't really know, um, you know, in, in a health system. And I think, yeah, like the STD case, for example, um, that's very sensitive. And I'm sure so many people are blocked from getting tested just because they have their own stigma for going in and talking to a person about that uh, potential. Um, so I think, yeah, you, you, you hit the nail on the head as far as, okay, macro level, it's the cost. But for the consumer, really that accessibility and convenience um, and willingness, right, to, to go ahead and um, get the care or checkups that they need. Uh, it's true. It's yeah. true. One of the, I think, important things that we've done with the platform, we talk a lot about the CDX, you know, the connected diagnostics uh, system. Mm -hmm. And that is a fundamental thing. Like we need to enable connected care with diagnostics in the home that's integrated and, and, and actually part yeah. of the clinical workflow. And and, and, and we're, we're starting there. And we were really focused on it. But I think the idea of, of care automation and applying mm -hmm workflow engine, decision engine uh, technology mm -hmm. as we've done uh, to these care workflows is something that uh, the time has come, right? I mean, these right. technologies are very baked at this point. They've been applied incredibly successfully to supply chain management, manufacturing, uh, yep. dealing with incredibly complex things. I mean, imagine all the components inside this iPhone, right? all yeah. needed to be shipped to a factory and all needed to be put together in a certain way. And then billions of these needed to be moved all around the world and everything tracked. And, um, you know, yeah. And now imagine applying the same technology that drives that from like, you know, service now, for instance, right. And mm -hmm. we did recently bring on the former chief architect at service now is now our chief okay. architect. Um, and that says Great. a lot because it shows where yeah. we're, we're, we're focused. Um, you imagine all that complexity that I just meant and, and how robust that those technologies are. Now look at applying that to the protocol for prostate cancer screening, right? Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. use this one example. There's, you know, a guy over 50 has his primary care, you know, annual checkup, and he has a high PSA level. That's a prostate cancer marker. Prostate cancer okay. is very slow moving cancer. And the protocol for that, assuming it's not off the charts high, is to monitor it, right? Twice a year, screen for the rest of their life. Currently, okay. that guy, a 50-year-old guy, for the next 40 years, has to take off work twice a year and go into the yeah. point of care and get a test that costs around 400 bucks that payers are reimbursed, wow. right? Mm -hmm. In Europe, there's a lateral flow PSA test that costs about $2.50, and we're working with that with that manufacturer, that, that test developer, right? Um, with our platform, you can establish what we call a care automation protocol that would be mm -hmm. authored by whoever the world expert urologist in prostate cancer is, right? Mm -hmm. And what it defines is basically um, each step in a clinical protocol. So with this one, it's okay. Monitor this patient uh, by doing a PSA screening twice a year. So every January 15th and July 15th, a PSA test is automatically drop shipped from an integrated 3PL. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the patient then gets annoyed with text reminders until they take the test, take the 10 minutes to take the test and scan it. Uh, if the levels are normal, the process just continues. If they cross a pre-programmed threshold that the mm -hmm. urologist offered into that care automation protocol, it automatically sets up an appointment for a biopsy. Okay. I mean, if yeah. you talk to any urologist, they'll tell you after year two or three, there's almost 100% drop off in adherence of coming in that second time of year to get tested. And, right. you know, the difference of coming in that, that, you know, that second time could be the difference of that prostate cancer yeah. metastasizing and spreading into your bones or uh, your lymph nodes and going from mm -hmm. something that was incredibly treatable, right? Just yeah. pull out your prostate <laughs> to... Yeah. Uh, oh my God, I'm now getting chemo and, and have a risk of, of, you know, very short yeah. lifespan, right? Um, right? That process that I just mentioned can be done for about a quarter of the current price. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no burnout from the provider. The provider's not having to deal with mundane stuff that algorithms are much better suited uh, to handle. 
Got it. Got it. And then, gosh, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, your your vision of this type of, uh, you know, workflow and, and automation and at-home diagnostics, um, you're, you're very well positioned in this market. What is your uh, commercial strategy? So our commercial strategy is essentially to partner with large players in the industry and provide okay. uh, past solutions. So platform as a service solutions. And the way we architected the mm -hmm. platform is um, we could provide someone like Cardinal, right? Who's one okay. of the biggest uh, med surge and pharmaceutical distributors. Um, and we actually recently uh, brought on uh, the retired CEO, uh, Mike mm -hmm. Kaufman of, of Cardinal is now on our board of directors. Um, okay. So a company like Cardinal that's already servicing, you know, thousands and thousands of uh you know, private mm -hmm. practices, um, independent pharmacies um, could basically, we could provide them a solution that, uh, you know, say a, a virtual pharmacy solution, right? That would allow independent mm -hmm. pharmacies uh, to have right. a hybrid virtual physical type care right. scenarios. And through deregulation, Absolutely. pharmacists can now requisition tests and even prescribe yep. a number of different medications. At the same time, right. they're under a barrage from population health and digital enabled competitors, right? Capsule, yeah, yeah. uh, True Pill, um, Nurse, mm -hmm. Roman Hymns. I mean, they're all like eating away at the independent pharmacist because if you're getting yeah. your ED medication, right, through Hymns, you're not going into your local pharmacy where you used to go pick it up, right? right. That's a lost patient, right. a lost script for them. So, you know, there is a real demand, a real need for that. So rather than us having to go out to 10,000 pharmacies, we'd enable mm -hmm. an entity like Cardinal, right? That right. already has those relationships, is already selling products and services, in some cases already SaaS software. Uh, they would then go uh, enabled by a past solution, you know, platform as a service solution that we give them to then go offer a SaaS solution to their existing Got customers. It. Got um, it. You know, another uh, example is with, with payers, um, so mm -hmm. we're, we're in discussions with a number of payers uh, around basically solving pain points or areas of cost uh, reduction um, that, that's possible by, um, you know, either semi-automating or, or moving the care scenario uh, into the home. So we, we see payers mm -hmm. as a big, you know, beneficiary of the, of the, of the platform. Um, you know, another is, is employers. Um, right. You know, they're there's more and more self-insured employers. And, you know, for the first time, you really have entrepreneurial minded um, people that have a say in the plan design, right? Because when you say mm -hmm. self-insured employers, it's not like they're actually handling the insurance. It's your tip typical mm -hmm. insurance providers like United or Aetna are actually behind the scenes doing the actuary tables and the actual insurance. It's just the company pays into that plan. And for that, they have a little bit of you know, say in the design of the plan. And, you know, right. their objective isn't just provide the care services at the lowest cost so the actuary table margins work out right. They also right. have the added, um, you know, challenge or desire uh, not only to reduce costs, but to reduce out of work time when an employee or a family member gets sick or is dealing with a chronic infection, right? So mm -hmm. now they're looking at how do we have preventative care Yep. Right. How do we yep. not only treat this UTI, but do it in 30 minutes as opposed to having to take a half a day off work or when this employee who's a single mom's kid gets strep throat for the third time in third grade. You know, how mm -hmm. do we have her mm -hmm. deal with that at home without having to take off work, drive across town, sit in a germ infested waiting room, potentially getting sick herself, all just to deal with her kids, you know, strep throat. Right. So we really see self-insured employers as being big drivers of innovation uh, because ultimately they'll prove out uh, these yep. cost savings and efficiencies um, and have the discretion and really the wherewithal and desire to try these new things. Um, and then that'll ultimately prove to the commercial payers, Hey, let's integrate these, you know, concepts into our commercial plans. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And then ultimately mm -hmm. CMS who will probably be the slowest adopter, just, you know, being the government, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of um, sort of proof points and market data uh, to, to either encourage or almost force them 
uh, you know, through, through, through Congress to adopt, you know, more efficient methodologies like that. Right. That's exciting. Yeah, I know. And I guess that's a, the big benefit of being a platform or, as you mentioned, like a, a platform as a service. Normally, if a startup was saying, oh, well, we can be used by uh, providers or payers or someone targeting independent pharmacies or governments. Right. You would tell them, oh, well, you're, you're crazy to target all of those. But if you have a platform that really has all of those building blocks that authentically can be built up to serve all of those cases and packages as a platform, not a SaaS, um, then then you can do that, right? And, and it actually makes sense to. Um, and it's funny because you hit the nail on the uh -huh. head. I mean, we, you know, uh -huh. we, we went out talking to, you know, your typical Silicon Valley, you know, funds about, about the, uh -huh. and we pretty much um, uniformly got, you're not focused. And, and what was uh -huh. funny is, you know, and, and, and I respect a lot of these people that, that told us that and that we, we, we got no's right. from. We luckily, we, we did $102 million in revenue last year. We generated about mm -hmm. $35 million in gross profit. So we just kind of, you know, used non-dilutive, uh, you know, profit mm -hmm. to, to basically, which we pretty much right. reinvested almost entirely into product development and engineering. Because at the end of the day, we are a computer science, you know, platform yeah. company. And um, so, but we, uh, you know, and, and we got that feedback, including from very, very smart people that just didn't get what you just, you know, very quickly understood mm -hmm. in that, they're like, you need to focus in this condition, or this area, or this customer category. And mm -hmm, the answer mm -hmm. was always why we've built something incredibly flexible that with, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. now hundreds and hundreds of settings in a matter of hours can be configured just as easily to deal with breast cancer recovery as toenail fungus, right? Or a solution right. for payers as a university, right? A independent pharmacy or a private you know, physician practice, right? And mm -hmm. there really is no difference to us in terms of how we architected uh, the platform. And, and that's why we see, you know, the opportunity mm -hmm. isn't up here at the surface. We really see ourselves yeah. being infrastructure, you know, layers Absolutely. below. And, and why we're now open sourcing and making SDKs so that you don't even have to use applications built on our platform. We can give it to Teladoc and to NERCs and Roman, HIMS, Livongo, yeah. um, you know, in integrated into EHRs so that mm -hmm. point of care providers can order connected home tests the same way they order, you know, qu tests from Quest and LabCorp now, right? That are just instead right. of being resulted back from a lab information system at a centralized lab and LIS, it's just being resulted back from your phone. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And it's interesting that you got that feedback from the, you know, the, the Valley and the Sand Hill uh, types of investors. But, but what I just learned about is, is your journey as an entrepreneur where, you know, actually you didn't start with the platform as a service. You started with your own problem around STDs and you ended up building into a SaaS and then into a flexible platform, right? So you didn't start with this grand notion that could, you know, only be achieved if people bought it. It's like you solved your own problem. You realized that it could solve many other problems and built a platform around that. Um, I, I, last question for you, Ken, is, um, I mean, I think your entrepreneurial journey is fascinating and all of the different, uh, you know, companies and, and pivots and building blocks that you've built to this point of being very successful. Do you have any advice for other entrepreneurs in digital health or, or otherwise? I mean, it's funny, and, and we've been discussing this a lot. I have a partner who's, who's worth pointing out. He isn't you know, officially a, a co-founder because he, he came on about, mm -hmm. you know, a year or so after we, we founded the company, but I look at him that way and I, I put him on the board. It's our, it's our CTO, uh, Demi Gino, uh, who okay. I, I constantly have people, Oh, you're a visionary. And it may be so on the business side, but I mean, he's really the technical visionary that's, that's made this a reality. And it has taken, you know, since that first proof of concept, single app, uh, we mm -hmm. had this sort of build and destroy iterative, sort of model. We built the first prototype of that. By the time it got ready to launch and we launched it, the code was so bloated because we were figuring out how to build it as we as we went along, right? And you don't want to do that. It's the worst thing you can do with, with, with software. Um, so we had two versions of that just in the proof of concept when it was just an app, mm -hmm. not, not a platform for creating apps. And we're now uh, microservice by microservice rolling out really mm -hmm. the third iteration of the actual platform version of it. Um, and uh, 
it's been really interesting because him and I both approach things differently in on one way in the way we think about things, okay. but also have a passion for abstracting problems. And, and, you know, right. I really, I look up to Elon and say what you will about him and mm -hmm. this and that, but, mm -hmm. but that guy, his heart is in the right place. And, and mm -hmm. you know, to, to bring it, you know, back to, to your question. Um, I think what he's, what, what, one of the things for two of the main components of his success, one is mm -hmm. that he breaks things down to first principle as he calls it. And that's what I was, okay. you know, just sort of getting to with, with Dimmy right. and, and how him and I think and how we've approached building this level of flexibility, which, you know, most people can't, you know, comprehend, let alone figure out how to actually architect and then code and, and bring to life. Right. And it is because we take every challenge and we break it down to what is its first principle? What is the fundamental of this problem? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, certainly mm -hmm. software engineers and architects, um, look at it at, at the problem level, right? Or maybe even the mm -hmm. causality mm -hmm. of the problem, but getting into the root causality that might cause the thing that causes the problem. Like you really right. have to break it down to its most fundamental building block. I mean, kind of what they're doing in CERN, trying to figure out what is the most fundamental building block of a, of a subatomic particle, right? It's like, right. there's an atom, everything's made of atoms. Well, what's inside of that? A nucleus, what's inside of that? What's inside of that? What's inside of that? And I think that's that's kind of important sort of advice and it, it's across industries. It really doesn't matter what you're working on, but if you don't know what those foundation principles are, um, mm -hmm. you're not going to build the right the right thing, right? You're going to build on a level above where you should be thinking or starting. Got it. And then finally, it's 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 really just again back to you know something that I think Elon personifies, and that is having mm -hmm. your guidepost, like having your objective, your mission, what it is that you're trying to accomplish, always clear. And insight. Uh -huh. And if you just use that as your sort of barometer, as you're just, you know, being hit with crazy winds and snows and machine gun fire and mortars and all the stuff that it takes to build a company, you always have this sort of guiding light to keep you going in the right direction. Because it's easy to lose track when you're in the jungle and you're taking machine gun fire and mortars and right. your investors are telling you this, your board's telling you that, mm -hmm. your customers yelling at you for that, and your friends suggesting this. and you know, it's hard to, to not lose sight of where you're going mm -hmm. or to get pushed off course. And because it's a long journey, every time you're pushed off course a little bit, you have to course correct, right? You're taking a lot more energy and capital to do it. So the more yeah. you can follow a straight line uh, towards what your objective is, um, I think that that's, that's really important. And I think having a mission that's bigger than your yeah. commercial outcome that you're looking for really helps to effectuate or operationalize that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think that's great advice, Ken. And, you know, I can tell you broke it down into first principle and then uh, had your mission. And when other people told you that mission was too big, you said, no, it's not. And I'm going to show you. And, and you've done that. Um, and, and that's awesome. Uh, so, you. Ken, it, it, it's been a pleasure having you on the pod. Uh, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing. Just learned a whole lot more of what you're doing and really agree that platforms like yours um, that are, are key to making quality care more accessible. And we have, you know, and to do that, we have to bring more care to the patients. Uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Take it easy. All right, thanks. Have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to this podcast and being a part of this movement. This podcast is brought to you by Persimmon Health and offering by Leapfrog Technology that's purpose-built to help innovators imagine, build, and scale digital health products. We're passionate about fixing healthcare and have worked on over 50 digital health products. If you want to share your story or want to work together, please shoot an email to hello at persimmonhealth.com. Thank you once again, and I look forward to seeing you on the next podcast.